it's not what Elon Musk says it is. He has a personal life story that was fraught with a lot of hardship and struggle, and he's mirroring that into his future. Is saying that building a company is like chewing on broken glass while you stare into the abyss. That's a bit extreme. It's not that bad, <laughs> but. If you believe in what you're doing is bigger than what you're giving up, it's an equation that you can justify. Before any world-changing innovation, there was a moment, an event, a realization that sparked the idea. Before It Happened is a show about that idea. Each week, we take a deep dive into a singular light bulb moment that inspired the visionaries to push forward and change our lives. I'm your host, Donna Laughlin. Nearly 20 years ago, I launched a public relations firm with the sole purpose of helping visionaries tell their stories to the world. Now, two decades later, I want to share those stories and more with you. This podcast takes you on a journey before it happened with the innovators who imagine and are still imagining the future. Ever since I was a child, I was curious about so many things. I spent hours in the garage at science fairs, sifting through popular science, popular mechanics, and pretty much any journal I could get my hands on, exploring and discovering how things work. From transportation and AI to just about anything you can put in your home, office, or pocket. On this show, you'll hear from the innovators themselves as they tell their stories of how they brought those visions to life. Grab your passport and let's go on a journey together. On today's show, we meet Jay Giroux, co-founder and CEO of Damon Motors, an electric motorcycle startup that is poised to do for two wheeled vehicles what Tesla has done for automobiles. Damon is Jay's third smart vehicle startup, and the idea to transform two wheeled transportation with an electric motorcycle came to him during a life-changing trip to Indonesia in 2016. At the time, he was running another startup he founded, the connected car platform Mojio, and was in Jakarta visiting a friend. Jakarta is a city with more than 10 million people and over 15 million motorcycles. Jay is a longtime rider himself, and while he was there, he was in an accident while navigating the motorcycle jam streets. It dawned on him that if he could make motorcycles cleaner and safer, he could have a massive impact on some of the most densely populated cities in the world. But before we get there, let's back up to before Jay started thinking about the future of transportation. Jay Giroux was born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. He spent most of his childhood and teenage years skateboarding, snowboarding, and cutting school. Jay was intelligent and endlessly curious, but he was a disinterested student and eventually dropped out of high school. It was a waste of time. The students in the classes had no interest in getting any work done, and I knew I could get better grades but I wasn't gonna get better grades hanging out with a bunch of other grade 11s who had no interest in getting work done. So I dropped out and came home to tell my mom that I was gonna go back to adult night school about a year later and I was gonna use my time working instead. I already had three jobs at the time during high school. And I said, I'm gonna drop those three jobs and turn one of them into a full-time job and go back to school at night, maybe a year from now with adults. And I didn't get that sentence out of my mouth. I got maybe the first three words out of my mouth which started with, I dropped out of high school today. And that was the end of that conversation. So I was thrown out of the house. That was about the 20th time, but that was the final time I was thrown out of the house. Anyways, I ended up getting a full-time job packing store shelves on graveyard shifts and then going to school before that for about six hours every day at night school. So yeah, academics wasn't really a high priority for me other than to graduate. Did I mention that Jay was a professional snowboarder? It's true, and all those hours on the mountaintops of Western Canada paid off. From his late teens to his mid-twenties, he competed all across the globe and became one of the top-ranked snowboarders in the world. But after leaving high school, Jay was on a parallel track. One track took him towards snowboarding. The other track took him toward entrepreneurship. He just didn't realize it yet. 
So when did the professional track for snowboarding kick in around that same time? Yeah, that point I'd been snowboarding for about five years and I started teaching. One of my jobs was to teach beginner snowboarding on one of the local mountains. And so I did a couple of nights of teaching every so often, really just to get a free pass. And then my best friend and I, we had a plan that we would move to Whistler after high school. He was a year younger than me and sort of got caught up. I forgot about all that. He forgot about that. And we were too busy skateboarding and snowboarding the local mountains. And I was managing a couple of coffee shops and, and selling coffee shop franchises. Uh, I was quite successful selling franchises. I didn't know. And there was this day I was looking up at the local mountains, seeing the snow on the mountain. And I was managing these coffee shops and selling franchises and completely had realized I'd forgotten for three years about the master plan to move to Whistler and chase professional snowboarding. And so I think that day I quit my jobs. And then like three months later, I moved to Whistler. That's when that really took off when I was 20. So what about after snowboarding? Where did that advance you to? In the off seasons in between snowboarding, which snowboarding could be anywhere between 200 and 300 days a year on the mountain. So there wasn't really a full off season, but you know, when there was actually not any snow on the mountain and you couldn't travel to snow somewhere else in the world, I was either running an action sports promotions company that I founded and promoting athletes, skateboarders and snowboarders and BMXers and stuff like that into other sponsored opportunities with brand sponsorships. Or I was running nightclubs. I ran nightclubs for a year, but only because I was able to plug all my sponsors in on the nightclubs. And so I actually set up like these visual feature events and brought in local DJs and break dancers and stuff like that. And, and was able to position my sponsors in more of a lifestyle scene in the off seasons in Vancouver. Eventually, after about seven years of professional snowboarding, well, I, had a, I had a peak year in 1998 and it was sort of a gradual tail off after that. The next few years saw Jay try his hand at numerous ventures. He helped found a women's activewear brand, and later, he and two friends tried to launch a motorcycle tour agency in Vancouver, but it never took off. He tried to reignite his snowboarding career, but time and injuries had taken their toll. By 2003, Jay was back in Whistler working as a bartender. It was there that he watched the U.S. invasion of Iraq on television. Just seeing the shock and awe bombing of Baghdad changed Jay's life and mission forever. I watched the bombing of Baghdad and I listened to CNN talk about how we're going to save everybody from the tyranny of evil. And I'm like, this is complete bullshit. It's obviously about controlling oil reserves in in Kuwait and, and all that kind of thing. And I spent many months really ruined over what I saw. And trying to think about what does a snowboarder from Whistler do about the dependence of oil on the planet? What could I, of all people, possibly do about oil dependence? And how do we get the world off oil? And I spent a long time in the background of all these other things I did. I spent a long time thinking about and researching on the web. What's the kingpin? What's the one thing that would change people's relationship to oil? Is it a different fuel source like E85 ethanol, or is it biofuels? Is it electrification? Is it hydrogen? Is it people getting solar on their roof? And I concluded that it's none of those things. It's our lack of awareness for our energy consumption. So when I saw that over the last hundred years, the oil consumption curve on a hundred year chart perfectly mirrors the human population growth curve. And there's no irony to that, right? We have an abundance of energy. We have an abundance of the ability to support life on Earth, and the population has exploded. And of course, we can't talk about reducing the population. So what we really need to do is become far more balanced as a human population with our consumption of everything. So that led me to realize that the missing link is our relationship to energy. You know, people flick a switch. And if you ask people, where does electricity come from? They say it comes from the wall. You know, no one has any idea how many watts, kilowatts, or kilowatt hours, or whatever they consume in their home. But we know exactly how many liters of gas we put in our car. Everybody knows their miles per gallon, but we don't have the equivalent awareness for the electric energy that is produced and consumed. And if we could, we could dramatically alter the way people relate to their cars and towards electric cars. So that kind of led me to founding Rev Technologies, which I did about a year after I stopped selling motorbikes, I guess would have been 2008. And Rev Technologies was really focused on on driving the adoption of not just electric vehicles, but solar on the roof so that we could be net producers of energy. So that at the end of the day, fast forward 50 years from now, 
nobody's taking power from the grid. Everybody's providing and consuming electricity that they produce locally from all of their solar roofs. So I thought if we could get there one day, that would be game changing for life on Earth. Rev Technologies was Jay's first foray into tech. He had never studied engineering. He had never gone to college, but it occurred to him in some form or another, he had been thinking about transportation and energy for most of his life. The electric bit is really interesting because six, seven, eight years old, my older brother used to race electric RC cars and they have a long antenna and then the remote control has a long antenna and I knew there were batteries in the car. And so I thought electricity was being transferred wirelessly from his remote control into his car. And that's how he was controlling his electric car. And whenever my dad pulled up his full size Ford Fairmont into the gas station, I argued with him that it didn't need gas. And he's like, how, what do you mean it doesn't need gas? I'm a naive eight, nine, 10 year old. And I said, well, cause you have a really long antenna on your car, just like Don's remote control car. So it's electric. It's getting electricity from the air. It doesn't need gas. And when I was 16, I was in auto mechanics class. And there was this moment when the auto mechanics instructor said, cars are about 15% fuel efficient. And I immediately felt really discomforted by that and said, wait, so I had a little Volkswagen Beetle. And to me, $20 at the time was a lot. So I said, if I put $10 gas into my car, does that mean $1.50 is driving the wheels? He's like, yes. And I said, so when I'm spending 85% of my money in the gas tank, is going to friction and heat? He said, yes. And I'm like, wait, so I'm buying friction and heat and emissions? Like, that's the fucking stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why are we putting up with that? Today, of course, we're putting $200 gas into our cars, and the vast majority of it is going to friction, heat, and emissions. So we're buying destruction to the earth is what we're doing. That really was a little seed. And then fast forward to the bombing of Baghdad was the first time I think I started spending a lot of time thinking about the ineffectiveness of the system that we're in. Jay had his epiphany in 2003 while watching the Iraq war unfolding on CNN. But his pivot toward electric vehicles didn't happen right away. First, there was Landmark Forum, the transformative learning and personal growth course championed by Lululemon founder and fellow Canadian Chip Wilson. There was a long period, like five years, where I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, the problem of oil. So I took Landmark Forum and that led me to taking the advanced course. In the Landmark Advanced course, you spend three days in this room for a weekend with 200 other people inquiring into all the reasons why you can't do what you want to do in life. You really get past each and every possible excuse of why you can't have what you want. And one of the things it asks in the Advanced course is after you get to realizing, and this is going to sound wrong, but to realizing that you are nothing, nothing with a capital N, is really meaning that you can be a blank canvas with which to paint a picture of any kind that you want for your future. And when you really, truly get that you are a blank canvas, you can then create who you are in a way that's different than what most people would think who they are. People would mostly describe what they are or what they do. Who I am is transportation transformed. And I declared that in the advanced course of Landmark Education and that I'll spend the rest of my life transforming transportation. Jay sold Rev in 2012 and launched Mojio. Then came that fateful trip to Jakarta in 2016 when he turned his attention to motorcycles. It's important to note that Jay didn't start riding motorcycles until he was 19. He didn't start selling them until his late 20s, but he had been interested in them his whole life. He had grown up in the 80s and 90s watching television shows like Chips, the popular cop drama that featured two motorcycle officers chasing bad guys every week. He was captivated by motorcycle daredevil Evil Knievel, but his mother made it clear that until he was much older, his own adventure on two wheels would be limited to his bicycle. When I was about five or six years old, my mom's babysitter would put me on his motorcycle, his sport bike, it was a BMW, and I was really, really tiny. He'd sit me in front of him on the motorbike and my little body would be over the gas tank, and all I could see was the speedometer. And then he'd drive me down the highway, dangling away, arms and legs dangling, just draped over a gas tank as the size of a five-year-old, 30 pounds wet maybe. And all I could see was that speedometer needle was way over to the right. And we were going really, really fast because, you know, it's highway. 
So that probably had a pretty big influence on me, but I wasn't allowed to ride motorbikes until I was 19. So I got my license when I was 19 and that's when it started. What was the first motorcycle that you drove that you got on by yourself? It was a Suzuki SV650S, which was a very popular bike, still pretty popular, but very popular bike for turning into amateur race bike. Yeah. So that's not a light, lightweight bike. Yeah, it's decent. It's only like 60 horsepower, but it was, you know, you could wheelie it and it was pretty fun. So can you dig in a little more about your knowledge for transportation or you could say mobility, but specifically motorcycles came in? Was it selling bikes or riding them or a combination of both? No, I think all of my intuition for what people want with a product, I think it comes from snowboarding, actually. And then it was augmented by my first technology company, which was called Rev Technologies. So in snowboarding, something I think that we're going to put an enormous amount of emphasis on is crafting a brand, a lifestyle brand. And in motorcycling, people don't wear Suzuki hats or Honda hats. I mean, you can buy one, you can go get one. But people don't throw themselves off a cliff to go get a Suzuki or a Honda hat. But if you look at KTM, which has aligned itself with Red Bull, their branding and their clothing and their lifestyle, Harley Davidson is a really good example. Harley Davidson as a brand for clothing is extraordinarily popular worldwide, even if you've never been close to one of their motorcycles in your whole life. And so I take the importance of building lifestyle products that people really want to align their personalities with. I take that from snowboarding. And skateboarding, we're largely, you know, this skateboard or that skateboard are almost identical. They're both sticks of wood. They all come from three factories. I mean, in the world of snowboarding, there might be a hundred different snowboard companies, but all the snowboards are manufactured at five factories around the world. So they're all coming from the same source. So what differentiates one from another is the brand. It's the sponsored athletes, the endorsements of these influencers, if you will. And I think that's hugely important opportunity for us at Damon to distinguish ourselves from the motorcycles that you know, the legacy motorcycle brands that really aren't lifestyle brands. Then that course fast forward all the way to 2016, where I was in Jakarta. And I realized if I've dedicated my life to getting the world off oil, and the car side of it's handled. Ironically, there's this motorcycle side. Now we're getting back to all that earlier story of, you know, my motorcycle passion. And the motorcycle side in the world is actually, it dwarfs the number of vehicles driven compared to cars. And of course, it's not being addressed in the way that the car industry is being addressed by dozens and dozens of electric car companies today. So here's this really big missing link where we don't see it, but two thirds of the human population cannot get to work without a motorcycle. There's no SkyTrain, there's no bus, you know, there's no alternative. You certainly can't walk on those roads. You'll be run over by a million motorbikes. And so the motorcycle is this forgotten form of transportation that's so vital. So Damon is not a power sports or a recreation sports company in the way you would look at Harley Davidson making discretionary products for wealthy people. That's not what Damon is about. Damon is is a transportation company. But the market had already had electric four-wheel electric vehicles. When you first had the thought of Damon, how many electric motorcycles are on the market? Well, that's a bit of a difficult one to answer. There are about just under 900 electric scooter companies. 895 of which use lead acid batteries and they cost about a thousand dollars and they service china by and large they service china you know these are really really low cost electric scooters in the motorcycle as i think we know it you know the highway capable high performance electric motorcycle there's a smattering there might be 10 or 15 startups and two or three whose names anyone would recognize maybe like maybe the Harley Davidson, Zero, Energica, and a couple of others that are, you know, lesser known. They're not very many. Well, and it's a huge undertaking, the problem that you're addressing, right? So having the, the prior entrepreneurship opportunities that you led, I mean, what did you have to give up this time with the Damon initiative in terms of your own lifestyle, like, you know, sweat equity? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> family time. <laughs> yeah, for starters, family time. I mean, I don't know. I've sold my car with every company. I've sold my car to pay bills, my own personal bills, because I couldn't take a salary or whatever. Sold my motorbikes, not had motorbikes for a couple of years. Sold all my RSPs, sold all my savings, sold all my investments. I've done that four or five times. You go to complete poverty every time you start a startup because it's that or, or quit on you know all the people that depend on you. 
and quit on the people that are excited about your vision and quit on your shareholders. And you can't do that. Have you summed that up in some form of mantra or credo? Well, kind of. You know, when I was like 12, I'd have an idea for something. I'd be, oh, this is so frustrating. The world needs blah, needs this widget, this product, this idea. And then sure enough, two years later, you'd see it done. It'd be really successful. And then you're thinking, oh, well, I should have done it, but I'm 12. What do I know? And then that happens again at 15. And that happens again at 18. And that happens again at 20. After a while, you get really sick and tired of having good ideas that you don't act on. And then you see other people being successful with those ideas. And so at some point in my life, in my early 20s, I think I realized that if you have an idea, it's absolutely your responsibility. Like an idea is an inspiration. You know, it comes from whatever higher source you want to claim it comes from. And if you don't apply that idea, you know, you are given a gift and someone else is going to. And it's, it's really your responsibility to see it through. I believe that very fully. So but eventually I started starting my own companies because I realized there was a need for these things and I'm lucky to have these ideas. And it comes with an enormous amount of difficulty and tough times and, you know, all that stuff that everybody talks about. It's not what Elon Musk says it is. I think he has a personal life story that was fraught with a lot of hardship and struggle as a kid and teenager. And he's mirroring that into his future is saying that building a company is like chewing on broken glass while you stare into the abyss. That's a bit extreme. It's not that bad. (laughs) But if you believe in what you're doing is bigger than what you're giving up, it's an equation that you can justify. Who is your inspiration? I mean, who's inspired you to keep creating? There's the obvious ones. There's Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and other successful people who've done great things who don't compromise on their vision. And I think that's absolutely fantastic to just not get whittled down by all the outside forces that think your business or your idea or your product should be different than you think it should be. And that's a really, really tough thing to to fend off. But on the other hand, growing up in the professional snowboarding world, I didn't idolize to be any of the big name snowboarders when I was a kid. I've never idolized to be a rock star or a celebrity or a successful entrepreneur. Matthew McConaughey says his idol is his self 10 years from now. And I think that's really the best way to say it. Aspire to your next self. Don't aspire to anybody else's self because it's it's not you. Can we talk a little bit about your experience in Jakarta? I've seen whole entire families on a moped or a motorcycle. <laughs> Dogs, yeah. cats, yep. grocers, their commerce and their transportation and their mode to school depends on it, right? Whether it's in Pakistan, India, or China. How are you going to influence that user experience with your mobility vision? Well, so I think that's a very common thing that we we conjure up when we imagine Taipei, Jakarta, Cambodia, you know, any of those cities where literally tens of millions of people ride a motorbike every day. But the truth of it is, for the Westerners who visit those cities, most of the time we go to the resort communities. And in the resort communities, there are fishing villages with good surfing and a nice hotel resort. And it's there where you see four or five family members without helmets on, a, on one, because they're going two miles at 20 miles an hour. But if you go to a major, major city, there is over 100 cities in the world with greater than 10 million people. There, it's rare to see more than one person on a motorbike or scooter. You might see two. And they're all wearing helmets. They're all wearing leather jackets. Even though it's 90 degrees Fahrenheit and humid as hell out there, they're all wearing helmets and leather jackets. The sophistication the average incomes, the attitudes, and the and the level of education in those cities is much higher than you're, than you're going to see in a fishing village in the remote outskirts where, where we'll go for vacation. So the reality is the vast majority of people are pretty responsible on their motorcycles in terms of that you know gear and, and, and not putting too many kids on one vehicle and all that kind of thing. But even if they could afford to buy a car, which is, you know, these are the fastest growing middle-class economies in the world now, and they're moving from a couple hundred dollars monthly income to a couple thousand dollars monthly income. Even if they could afford to buy a car, they would be at such a tremendous disadvantage. The car can't move through the thicket of motorcycles that all swarm around at the, at every stoplight. So it, it's very different. They don't have red lights or stop signs every, I don't know, quarter mile or whatever the length of a block is in the United States. They have massive roads that you can drive for an hour and a half in downtown Jakarta and not hit a stop sign or a red light. These huge circling roads that you know, they're, they're 60, 70, 80 miles long and they circle around the outsides of a giant city. 
without any stopping. So the, the flow of traffic is really, really good. And the motorcycles are often spread quite apart. And you only see them all literally shoulder to shoulder at a red light when everybody stops and they all just pack in and you'll get 40 motorcycles across in a road that's wide enough for two cars, maybe. And of course, the cars or the trucks get pushed way back as all the motorcycles flow around them. But the population densities in these cities are, are five to 10 times higher than Manhattan, which is the highest population density in North America. So it's pretty unimaginable. And that's why the car is never going to make sense for more than half the world's population. It'll never make sense. It's not about incomes. It's not about affluence. It's about actually moving at more than three miles an hour. So tell me about the accident you had. Well, I did have an accident. It wasn't an accident on the motorbike where a truck hit me or anything like that. It was being a little, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty big risk taker. I'm not uncomfortable with very much. You know, most people wouldn't get on a motorcycle and ride in Jakarta. And even I was a little, little unsure about this idea. But I did. I was with my best friend who lived there at this point. And when they, people say that, you know, red lights are a suggestion, they really mean that. You know, if the light is red, but you can go, you don't just go. You and 200 other motorbikes go. And you stop the dump truck from crossing through who has the right of way. As the motorbikes, you know, and there's 10-year-olds in schoolgirl uniforms riding their motorbikes around these dump trucks and in between two of them. And as there's five or six motorbikes in front of you, you have to ride along with them or they will run you over. So suddenly you find yourself doing things you would never consider doing, like riding a motorbike between dump trucks where your elbows are bouncing off both sides. So I found myself riding along on a sidewalk because everybody was, but not on the sidewalk on the, on the side of the road that you're supposed to be on against the flow of traffic on a sidewalk. And I've got a funny little video of it. And the sidewalk just ends all of a sudden and drops off. And that's where I fall off the bike. But the saturated in the way that people live, in the way they ride their motorbikes in a city like that for nine days, I came away. My first thought on the plane on the way back was at how mesmerized I was at the way 100 or 200 motorbikes would move exactly like a flock of birds. They'd stay equal distance apart. Occasionally, one would cross over and break away from the flock you know, to pull over there for some reason. But the majority of the time, you'd be going 30, 40 miles an hour with a couple hundred bikes spread over, I don't know, a couple hundred feet, and they'd move like a flock of birds. And I was mesmerized by that. I thought, what if we could develop, you know, the way drones can fly in synchronicity in the sky, and they can shape, they can create shapes in the sky because they're programmed to move together. What if we could program motorcycles to do that, where you wouldn't have to ride at all, and the entire fleet of motorcycles would move as a single unit? or at least four of them acting like a car. The reason why motorcyclists in North America ride with each other is because there's safety in numbers. When there's four of us, we take up the space of a couple of cars and it gives us more, more of a bubble of safety around us. So that was idea one, was how do we create completely autonomous motorcycles that can move like a flock? And I concluded that I don't ever want that. I don't want to ride a motorcycle that I don't have to pilot. That would be no fun. But you start with crazy and you work your way back to possible and then go forward again. And so that's really what gave us the roadmap that Damon has to get to semi-autonomous collision avoidance. When I really looked at the accident rates, you know, here it is that seemingly everybody's moving like a perfect flock of birds, but the accident rates and the death rates are actually unbelievably high compared to cars. So the problem is big times, you know, it's big squared. It's a really big problem. Was that your first vision for the, your zero fatalities by 2030? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I think we have to set a goal that's seemingly impossible because it changes the way people work. It changes what we believe that we can do. You know, when I founded Damon, I was really not sure we could make motorcycles safer. I had no idea how that was even possible. But by saying we're going to do it and then staying true to that, what you said, you give your word to something and you don't ever release yourself from your word. A path always opens up. So even thinking that we can make motorcycles safer was crazy. Thinking we can make them electric and, and more powerful than a gas motorcycle was even scarier, actually. Can we achieve zero crash fatalities by 2030? I know we can achieve zero crash fatalities. I don't know when exactly. But you know, let's put a time out there that seems doable and then do everything we can to get there. Jay, is Damon a Western solution? That's a really great question. Damon is not a Western solution because if it is, 
if I had designed it that way, I've already failed. So Copilot is a collision warning system using commodity sensors that you'll find on a car that does collision warning systems on cars. Of course, a motorcycle moves very differently than a car. They can lean a lot. They pitch a lot. They float within a lane because a motorcycle doesn't take up nearly as much space as a car. In California and other states, you can lane filter in between lanes of cars. So you really need a system that's intelligent enough to adapt to the traffic of the geography. And so we've put a lot of thought into that. How do we develop something that does work for the North American customer today? Because this is where there's profit margins and where expensive technology can eventually be commoditized. But most importantly, how do we roadmap our collision warning system to behave the way you need it to for, you know, New Delhi and Jakarta and Mexico City, which are all, they all have considerable nuances in how traffic behaves, which itself is really interesting. So, you know, the connectivity of the motorcycle, enabling over-the-air software updates, having algorithms that are geographic specific are all really key parts of how we architect a collision avoidance system that works differently, but equally well in Mexico City as it does in San Francisco. Just talk a little bit more about the user experience. Your Jakarta experience was pretty extreme. So if you take that experience and now you're on a Damon Hypersport, does the rider need to adapt to the technology or vice versa? My co-founder Dom and I have a, a really fun saying that you can't fix stupid meaning there was no system to protect me from falling off a motorcycle on a sidewalk, right? That said, in some ways you can fix stupid. So Copilot is pretty intuitive. It's nothing like any other motorcycle you ride. You know, when you get on it, it's exactly like any other bike. It's only when there is an urgent warning, in the case like a Ford collision warning, that you get a haptic vibration in the handlebars. And for anybody, that haptic vibration is very visceral. So the reaction time between your hand and your brain is shorter than the reaction time between your eye and your brain. You know, and a great example is putting your hand on the stove. You can see the stove is hot, and yet still we put our hand on the stove, and then we react and realize, oh, shit, why did I do that? So the visceral reactability to the vibrating handlebars is incredibly effective. So until there is a car cutting in front of you, this motorcycle feels like any other. And the moment that a car is cutting your right of way, could be someone turning left in front of you in an intersection, could be a parked car pulling out while you're shoulder checking and you can't see that parked car, any of those kinds of instances, a car coming out of an alley while you were looking to change lanes and you're looking the other way. I mean, these things happen to all riders literally every single time we ride a motorbike. We have moments where we get cut off because cars just don't see us. And statistically, three quarters of all motorcycle accidents are caused by drivers and two thirds of them occur in intersections. Of those accidents, there are all three types of accidents. It's being T-boned in an intersection, being hit from the front or being hit from behind. So if we can develop a system that warns riders of just those three most common causations in the most common location, which is an intersection, we could knock out half or more of all motorcycle accidents right there. So we don't need a system that deals with every possible scenario. We just need a system that deals with the most common types of scenarios. So the Ford Collision Warning System, our blind spot system, which you know alerts you to cars in your blind spot and the LCD screen that shows you everything behind you, those handle the three most probable ways that a motorcycle would be in an accident. We've had the LAPD ride it, several officers of the LAPD. We've had executives and engineers from top motorcycle companies all over the world ride the bike. We've had about 50 local riders, local just everyday consumer riders in Vancouver ride it. And we don't tell people how it's going to work. We just put them on the bike and send them out. And within about 10 minutes, they have an incident where they get nearly cut off. Usually within 30 minutes, something happens 100% of the time. The cameras on the bike are recording the same thing that the rider sees. So we can actually correlate what the rider experienced and what they told us to what the cameras actually saw to what the motorcycle actually reacted to. And use those three levels of data to see the efficacy of the system is really like 100%. Those are some test pilots, but what is the general? response? Oh, to the bike in general, it's pretty exciting. I think as of today, we crossed over a thousand pre-orders just for the super sport bike. And you got to appreciate, you know, a super sport motorcycle is, is about as popular as a Ferrari or a Tesla Roadster. I mean, we're talking really low volume relative to say a Toyota Camry or a very generic motorcycle. So the hypersport sits in a category that's very small. And uh, a thousand is a very, very meaningful number in a, a small category like the superbike category. 
So today we've had over a thousand pre-orders. We've had well over a billion media impressions. The guys at TechCrunch said we drove more traffic to their website than any other article in the entire previous year in the first articles that came out about Damon on TechCrunch, which is unbelievable. There's a couple hundred third-party videos about Damon. The people are producing content for Damon and getting millions of views, and we don't have anything to do with it. There's clearly a pent-up demand and a need that's gone unaddressed for such a long time. So are you the new gold standard for motorcycles? Not yet. Not until we shipped at least a thousand. But you know, we're engineering the gold standard, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. So if you talked about your snowboarding user experience, your first motorcycle ride, the ultimate experience with the Damon Hypersport when you first got on the prototype, what was that like? Oh, that was good. <laughs> I'm glad you brought that up. My co-founder, Dom, is he's been obsessed with motorcycles much more deeply than I ever have been, to be honest with you. And it sure shows in, in his innovation. I mean, Dom was the one who said, why don't we make the handlebars vibrate for a collision warning? And I am not an engineer because I had no idea how we could have done that. And he's like, oh, we just put a little motor inside the handlebar. And like, can we, will that work? He's like, yeah, it should. You know, so Dom is the one who thinks of these things and he thinks about where to put the light bar and can you put up an LCD screen that acts like a rear view mirror in a car? You know, would that work? How would you make it not too bright? How would you make it not reflect on the visor of the helmet? There was a day when we had a completely stripped down Hypersport prototype and all you could see was the kind of the skeleton of it, if you will. And he's standing there looking at it under a very bright light in this old garage we were in back in 2018. And, he, and he's, he's got his hand on his chin. And he says, you think we could make the handlebars go up and down and the foot pegs move? And I thought, why the hell would you want to do that? And he says, well, it'd be, it'd be cool. You could have like two bikes in one. You could have a commuter bike in one moment, press a button, and you could have a super bike. And you know, just to give you guys some idea, if you don't ride motorbikes, imagine having a beach cruiser and a road bike in one. You know, a road bike is very difficult. You're not going to enjoy a road bike on Sunset Boulevard at low speed. And a beach cruiser is not going to win a race. So imagine having two in one. And so I said, well, is that possible? And he's like, I think so. And I said, well, how long would it take and how much money to build it? He's like, oh, a couple of weeks. And I said, I don't know. That sounds unrealistic and crazy. So I walked away and thought about it for half an hour. And I came back and I said, if it takes two weeks, you have to do it. Anything that's that small of an effort for that big of a potential change, you have to do it. So they built a prototype where the handlebars glide up and down four inches, the foot pegs move, and the windscreen changes angle, and they three parts do it together. And what we have is effectively what's called a rider triangle. And so the Damon Hypersport transforms at the push of a button from an upright riding position to a super sport riding position, and you can stop it anywhere in between. But you can do it while you ride. So there was this moment when I went out on the bike and I'm riding through the city in Vancouver at city speeds. And there's an on-ramp that goes from street level up onto a bridge. And it's a big sweeping 90 degree curve that rises up like 50 feet onto this bridge and merges with the bridge. And on the bridge, you can go up to highway speed. So I start accelerating up this on-ramp curving. I'm leaning on an angle and I press the button to transform the bike down into sport mode. And as I'm doing that, I'm already in a lean and, you know, accelerating from whatever, 40 to 80 miles an hour. And the handlebars pull me down into the bike. And it's this feeling of being merged with the machine. Some people who've ridden it, and there's a video on YouTube where one of the test riders says it felt like going into battle mode in the Batmobile. It was super exciting. It was just absolute revelation. Was there ever any thought of just building an operating system or did you always know Damon would be a bike? Oh, yeah. We pivoted and pivoted back and pivoted and pivoted back in 2017 through 2019. The large plan was always to build our own bike. We knew that a bunch of the technologies really have to be so grafted into the architecture of the motorcycle itself that any way of taking just, say, the collision warning system and trying to like make it a modular add-on to an existing motorbike or to a Yamaha or Suzuki's motorbike, we knew that would be a tremendous compromise in the user experience and it would ultimately fail. So if we, if we went down that road, it would be bad for safety on the whole because it would fail. And that would be bad for this whole concept of making motorcycles safer. But we were very tempted to keep trying anyway. So because the size of the problem of building our own motorbike was so great, how do we just build Damon in bite-sized chunks? So we focused on the collision warning system only. One of the biggest things that I believe is that to really change the world, you have to shift people's paradigms. 
And so in motorcycling today, the statement that all motorcyclists use with each other is it's not if, it's when. And what that means is it's not if you have a motorcycle accident, it's when you have a motorcycle accident. And many years ago, I took that to mean, well, if it's when, then really it's how bad. If we're all going to have a motorcycle accident, then how bad is it going to be? Will I get lucky and just break my shoulder, which I did? Or will I be a lot less lucky, like some other people I know? And I thought, my God, we have to tip that paradigm around because you don't get into a car wondering when or wondering how bad. You know, we don't do that in cars. So how do we totally alter the paradigm, completely reshape the paradigm of motorcycling to the more you ride, the smarter your bike gets and the safer everyone gets? And the way to do that is with data and connectivity. So if we put collision warning systems on everyone else's motorbikes, we can't collect the data off the bike with which to build new algorithms that are sent over the air so that every mile I ride makes you safer. And every mile you ride makes everybody else safer. And that compounding learning is what gets you to zero crash fatalities by 2030. So if you look at the youth today, the younger than millennials and this zero fatalities in 2030, how do you inspire the, the younger generation to do exactly what you've done, which is to cast a very big goal and to think beyond the obvious? How do you inspire that? You know, if you're on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and there's this billionaire talking about how he changed the world and this billionaire talking about how he changed the world. And there's, you know, there's all this content out there about becoming so much and I actually think most people don't need to. I don't think the 99 out of 100 12-year-olds out there need to beat the crap out of themselves because they don't have a big idea. I think we all will find our own destinies and the things that matter to us. And you know, some people just want to get married and have kids. So that's totally awesome. And some people give up too much of their time with their kids to chase stupidly big dreams. <laughs> and, and we just have to do whatever it is that's inside us that we can't ignore and just be okay with it. Otherwise, we're unhappy. I would rather have more time for my kids, but I would be unhappy. And I love my kids and you know, take them on planes with me to go to half my work trips going forward so I can find ways to have the best of both worlds. I really do believe you can have it all in life. But I don't believe that we all have to break ourselves the way some people do. You know, someone to Google Damon and say in the next 10 years, what would you like them to read about Damon? Well, in 10 years, we'll be the most valuable motorcycle company in the world, probably less than 10 years. We will have completely rewritten all the rules for what is a motorcycle, reset standards of expectation from the consumer public. In 10 years, the industry will be probably just turning the corner in accepting the inevitability of Damon's type of product, and they'll be following. And I'm saying that because it's taken the car industry 14 years to begin to copy Tesla. It's enormously difficult not just ego-wise, but supply chain-wise and industry-wise and labor union-wise for our car companies to do anything different than, than what they're doing. There's a whole bunch of reasons why they don't follow Tesla. And part of it is they don't want to follow Tesla, but a, a much bigger part of it is the other stuff. But we will have taken away enough market share in 10 years that they will be forced to change. The motorcycle industry will be one where safety matters. And they'll be working on it the way we are, or they'll be licensing our technology because we're making it matter. It didn't matter because no one talked about it and no one was allowed to talk about it. And in 10 years, it'll be expected by the consumers won't ride motorbikes that don't have technologies like Damon's. Simple as that. That was Jay Jarreau. Though he mentioned Elon Musk was someone he admires, he said he disagrees with his idea of what it's like to start a business. Jay says when he truly believes in the solution he's creating, and understands why the world needs it. The effort is always worth more than what he's giving up. You see, with Damon, he's on his own mission to achieve zero fatalities on two wheels by 2030. Before It Happened is produced by me, Donna Laughlin along with Studio Pod Media. The executive producer is Katie Sunku Wood, and all episodes are written and developed by Jack Buer. Our show coordinator is Deanna Morency, with additional editing and music provided by Nota Lab. Make sure to subscribe to Before It Happened wherever you listen to podcasts.